You know, as Mark prayed for the preparation, uh, the, the message tonight was 44 years in preparation. <laughs> I've been saved for 44 years. And you know what I'm teaching you is the accumulation of thousands of hours of study as well as hearing the word of God and so forth and so forth. Obviously, I didn't learn this overnight, and you're not as well. But what we're covering is extremely important as we look at the seven dispensations, and tonight the dispensation of conscience during this session. Again, always keep in mind that life was different before the fall than after the fall. There was innocence, then conscience. Before the flood, then after the flood. Conscience and then human government. Before the Tower of Babel, then after the Tower of Babel, which involves then the dispensation of promise, Egyptian bondage, law, eventually the cross, grace, which involves the church, the tribulation to come after the rapture, and the kingdom to come, which is everlasting, the first phase being a thousand years, which Christ will be the focus. And then there's the great white throne judgment where Satan will be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever, so will his demons and also those whose names are not written in the book of life are cast into the lake of fire. In your handout, it should look like something like this, but please keep in mind those important times of judgment that do separate those dispensations. Now, as we're looking at conscience, man's state at the beginning actually begins guilty because it comes right off the fall of man. Then the eyes of them both were naked, Genesis 3 says, and they knew that both were opened and they knew that they were naked. Now we know in chapter 2, verse 25, that they were both naked and they weren't ashamed. But in chapter 3, they're ashamed, they're naked, they're hiding from God. Something has happened and what has happened is sin. In fact, in Genesis 3, 22, then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. But experientially, unlike God who knew it without experiencing it. And now lest he put out his hand and take also the tree of life and live forever. Again, tying into what we were covering last hour, he then is put out of the garden. As a ruling factor, God had built into man now a conscience so he could understand the consequences of wrong choices. We see in Genesis 3.10, so he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. See, he had never experienced negative consequences to a choice before. He knew what he was doing was wrong. He had a guilty conscience. By the way, Having a guilty conscience is not a bad thing in the sense that when you no longer sense guilt in your conscience, when you have done what is wrong, that's the bad thing. Though obviously what prompts the guilty conscience is not a good thing. God's word tells us a man's conscience can be seared with a hot iron and therefore cause the conscience in a sense to burn out. 1 Timothy 4.2, these false teachers will be speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, a hot iron searing your skin, pssst. You know, a number of years ago, I'm thinking, was I married or not? You know, I think, yeah, I think I, no, I don't think I was married. Uh, I worked on a construction project, and you know, Gus Lehman would be familiar with this, at an Aurora at the swimming pool there. His mother has been a coach on the swimming team for many years. I helped put that initial roof on. It was in January or February, it was cold. And I was just a, a grunt laborer. And I would carry these hot buckets of tar. And, and as I was carrying one, it started to splash, and for some reason, somehow, it splashed up and hit my covered arm. But it was cold, right? So what did it do? Ran right on down, right into my glove. And to this day, I have a big burn section right there. Yeah, and it hurt. And you know, you take a, a pin and you stick it right there today, you know what? Can't feel anything. 
Why? Because it's been seared with hot tar. And God says that's what can happen to your conscience as you violate it over and over and over again. And these false teachers have their conscience seared with a hot iron. They don't sense guilt like they are because their conscience is seared. Now, as we think of conscience, as the dispensation of conscience has as its ruling factor conscience, but as conscience still continues today, just like human government still continues today, such just like promises still continue today, and so forth, let's think about how the conscience is described in Scripture. And this is a little interesting study I did today. I've never done it before. And I just looked at verses dealing with a conscience. First of all, there is a convicted conscience. John 8, 9, then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. Remember, this is the situation where the woman was caught in adultery and brought before Jesus and told, what should we do to her? And he says, you that are without sin, let them cast the first stone. And those who heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. Isn't that interesting? Because the older you are, if you still have a conscience, you know you're guilty. You know you don't even live up to your own standards, let alone God. And so they were convicted by their conscience. George Zeller, in his material on dispensations that you use as an, ex an external workbook talks about it's like a dash, a light on the dashboard. Now, you have any of those that are lit up in your car? I do. I almost always do. <laughs> you know? And what do you usually do? Just disregard them, right, until something really goes. They're there for a reason. And too often, we disregard things in our conscience. They're flashing like, I don't see any flashing like, Let's see a flashlight. A convicted conscience. Number two, a good conscience. And it's interesting as this phrase is found in several passages. A good conscience. A good conscience is an upright conscience. A conscience that is, has good standards in it. Acts 23, 1, then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, men and brethren, I, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Now, is he saying he never sinned? No. But when he sinned, he admitted it as sin. That's what allows you to have a good conscience. The Norman standard was recognized. It was implanted at birth. It was developed through training. And when violated, it was adjusted to accordingly. See, everyone's born with a conscience. We will see that in Romans 2. But that conscience can become developed, and it should through a Christian home that upholds standards of right and wrong, or it can be seared, it can be confused, and so forth and so forth. Notice, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1.12 regarding his ministry, for our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, and more abundantly toward you. And I will tell you, there's something really to be said for having a good conscience. A good conscience. That you can look at your ministry, and that's what he's saying. And he's saying, I have conducted it in simplicity and godly sincerity. I've conducted ourselves in the world in the way God wants, and I have a good conscience about it. 1 Timothy 1.5, now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. 1 Timothy 1.19, having faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck. When you move away from sound doctrine, what happens is you shipwreck your faith and you hurt your conscience. See, that's one of the problems, by the way, with carnality. One of the problems with carnality is if people remain in sustained carnality, they suck in human viewpoint. When they suck in human viewpoint, their conscience gets 
shifted in their thinking. They no longer are sharp on what's right or wrong. And pretty soon, they're backing and endorsing the wrong thing because their conscience have become shipwrecked like their faith. Thirdly, there is a clear conscience. Now, what's the difference between a good conscience and a clear conscience? I don't know if there is. But I do know that Paul says in Acts 24, 16, this being so, I myself always strive, I always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. I always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. In other words, I always try to keep a good conscience with God and, and even towards men. If I could have resolved something, had I apologized, had I taken care of something in a way that was not right, I want to get it right. A clear conscience. Number four, a witnessing conscience. A witnessing conscience. In other words, your conscience can bear witness in your thinking regarding whether you did what was right or not. Romans 2.15, which we'll see later, tells us that the law of God, or excuse me, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, the Gentiles, who don't have the Mosaic law, show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness in between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. Their conscience bears witness. In other words, they have an inbuilt sense of right and wrong without having the Mosaic law because they have a conscience. Paul says the same thing in Romans 9.1. I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness. Bearing me witness about what? That I'm not lying. What I'm telling you is the truth. In Romans 13, 5, therefore, you must be subject to human government and civil authorities, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. So before the Lord, you can have a good conscience that what you did was right by submitting to the government. When you don't submit to the government, you can have a guilty conscience. A fourth kind of conscience, or fifth kind of conscience that's described is a weak conscience. Conscience, excuse me, a weak conscience. 1 Corinthians 8, 7, however, there is not in everyone that knowledge, for some having consciousness of the idol until now eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. In other words, here was people who came out of pagan backgrounds in which meat was offered to idols as part of their religious system. In their mind, they can't disconnect the meat from the idol. They're weak in the sense they've not understood their freedom in Christ and the liberty they have. And therefore, when they're eating their meat, they're saying, you know, this was offered to idols. I shouldn't be doing this. That's a weak conscience. But you shouldn't violate it even when it's weak. But when you grow in Bible doctrine and you understand grace, then you'll be able to eat and say, this is good meat. Yeah, I know it was offered to idols, but idols are nothing. He says the same thing in 1 Corinthians 8.10. For if anyone sees you have knowledge eating in an idol's temple with a restaurant connected to it, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? In other words, you're encouraging them to eat something that they're not ready to eat because in their conscience they haven't understood grace to know that they're free to eat whether that meat was offered to idols or not. So you're actually egging them on to do something that will violate their conscience, and this is not good. He says in 1 Corinthians 8, 12, but when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. So you can have a weak conscience. Furthermore, you can have a pure conscience, uncontaminated by false doctrine, uncontaminated by sin. A pure conscience. Regarding deacons, they were to hold the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. That was one of their qualifications. They have a pure conscience before the Lord and a good testimony because of it. In 2 Timothy 1.3, Paul says regarding Timothy, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience. 
Notice Paul served God with a pure conscience. Called also a good conscience, also called a clear conscience. Furthermore, there is a seared conscience, and we've looked at this already, 1 Timothy 4.2, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And clearly, you do not want to have a seared conscience. You want to avoid that if all possible. Furthermore, there is a defiled con conscience. A defiled conscience. Well, what is that like? Well, first, Titus 1.15, to the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. Defiled by what? By the standards of the world. Defiled by sin. And frankly, we live in a whole society that has a defiled conscience. A lot of them have defiled conscience. It's been spotted, stained by the thinking of the world. Furthermore, you can have a cleansed conscience. A cleansed conscience. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, if the blood of bulls and goats did da-da-da, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Cleanse your conscience from dead works, those works that could never atone for sin, those works that could never justify or save you. You can cleanse your conscience from that. You see, under law and under a performance-based plan of salvation, either you live in self-righteousness because you're deceived, or you will live in a guilty conscience all the time because you can never measure up. And the only way to get it cleansed, as it were, is to understand the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Lastly, there is an evil conscience. Hebrews 10.22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. An evil conscience. And indeed, we have an evil conscience before we're saved. Now that we're saved, we've been cleansed, we have been forgiven, and we can have a clear conscience. God said even those who have not the Mosaic law, number four, are accountable whether Jew or Gentile, and therefore know right from wrong. Now I want you to turn in Romans to see this. I want you to go to Romans chapter 1 first. Romans chapter 1. Now in Romans 1.18, we have the first major section of the book following the introduction. And in doing so, what will be underscored is the fact that there is none righteous, no, not one. They have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. What truth? Because what may be known of God is manifest, notice this, in them. For God has showed it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Verse 19 underscores conscience. Verse 20 underscores creation. So there's something outside of you called creation that tells you there's a God. There's something inside of you, namely conscience, that tells you there's a God. Now in chapter 2, when he begins to talk about the moral man, and in particular the Gentile, he says... Verse 12, for as many as have sinned without law, who would that be? Who have sinned without law? Gentiles, right? Will also perish without law. They still perish because they've sinned. And as many as have sinned in the law, who's that? The Jews will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. 
there's only one problem. Who is the perfect doer of the law? Nobody. Verse 14, for when the Gentiles who do not have the law, was the law ever given to the Gentiles? No, it was given to Israel, right? So that's why you can find somebody in a tribal group in Papua New Guinea who have never been heard of the Ten Commandments, never heard the name Moses, never heard the name Jesus in their life. And when asked, is murdering your, your neighbor wrong, they would say, yeah. In fact, when asked, one responded by saying, well, how do you know? And he said, well, that little man inside of me tells me that it's wrong. The little man inside of you is called the conscience. But God has implanted upon everyone. They know it's wrong. The problem is, verse 14, for when the Gentiles who do not have the law, by nature, do the things in the law. By nature, they do the things in the law. By nature, they know it's wrong to lie or it's wrong to steal and so forth. And as a result, there are some that seek to abide by that. These, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience, there it is, also bearing witness between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. Their thoughts either accuse them, what you did was wrong, or they excuses them, you know, what you haven't really done is wrong. That is what a conscience does. Now, you've heard people just say, you just have to do what's in your heart. You just have to trust your heart. You know, Proverbs says, he that trusts his own, his own heart is a fool. Proverbs. Unless that heart has been instructed by the word of God. Because then if you have Bible doctrine in your heart, you can have a sense of this. And by the way, that is one of the values of, of training kids in a Christian home is they get a chance to hear the norms and standards of God to develop a conscience at a young age. And that's why sometimes when they rebel, they rebel so bad. Because in their mind, they know more acutely than the untrained person what's right or wrong. And therefore, they're fighting a lot harder. That's why you've heard it said, you know, the worst kids in the school are the pastor's kids. You hear that? The reason is they hang around with the deacon's kids. But I'll tell you this, growing up in Aurora, I'll tell you the, one of the, some of the worst hell raisers were pastor kids. Why? I think in some cases because they had some truth communicated to them. In other cases, they saw some real blatant hypocrisy, and it really turned them off. Number five, another ruling factor in this time of conscience I don't know if ruling factor is the right word here, but it is the restraining of the Holy Spirit. The restraining of the Holy Spirit definitely came into play here because we know in Genesis 6, 3, and the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with men forever. My spirit, the Holy Spirit, shall not strive with men forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. In other words, for another 120 years, the Holy Spirit would, in a sense, restrain man, though things were bad and in need of judgment, for 120 years while Noah was building the ark. You say, well, what revelation was given to them? Well, we saw this under innocence, but again, when we were looking under innocence, we're looking at the consequences of sin, so we are ready into conscience. One of the things that was clearly communicated to man was not only was your conscience to be your guide, as it were, but also the way to approach God was by faith with a blood sacrifice. And that was taught by God himself, either verbally or by example, to Adam and Eve, who then had the responsibility of passing that down to their children. That's why Hebrews 11.4 would say, by faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Question, how did he even know to do it? 
Well, he was given that revelation by God through his parents, most likely, unless God told them verbally, but most likely through his parents. So man's responsibility was to obey God under conscience. Remember, the responsibility always is to obey God under, with the revelation that you've been given. Okay, question. Want to grab a mic there? On number five, just another ruling factor, the restraining. Can you just explain that? I'm just having a hard time understanding yeah, what that means. Yeah, the word striving carries the idea of kind of restraining man, and that the Holy Spirit was involved in restraining man's wickedness so that it, as bad as it was, and it was bad, it wasn't as bad as it could have still been. And the also, the same is true even today, because we know from 2 Thessalonians 2, that the mystery of iniquity is already at work. Only he who now restrains will continue to restrain until he be taken out of the way. So the Holy Spirit is restraining Satan's diabolical plan to put into place the Antichrist and to dominate the world through that means. That is not a new plan. In fact, when we get to the next dispensation, you will see that Nimrod was, was certainly Satan's man of the hour at that point, and he is the one who actually headed up the Tower of Babel fiasco. So that's the idea of it. But I will say this, I did some study in the Hebrew on that word strive, and there's some difference of opinion of what it means. But it clearly seems to be indicating that for another 120 years, the Holy Spirit would restrain the wickedness of man until the ark was built. Yep, you're welcome. Don't hesitate ever to ask questions about clarification. Okay, when it comes to man's responsibility was to obey God, man now had the choice to do what was right and not do what was wrong. And not only the choice, he had the conscience. In fact, we can put The conscience to do what was right and not do what was wrong. Now go to Genesis chapter 4 with me. Genesis chapter 4. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife. Now the word knew speaks of sexual intimacy. You know what's interesting about the Bible? when it comes to even the issue of sexual intimacy, is that the Bible's not afraid to tell it like it is. And yet, even when it does, it uses sometimes kind of respectful, veiled words to do it. It's not raw and raunchy. And I say that because there are some pastors today who almost pride themselves into thinking that they are, you know, like I know one pastor, well, he's no longer in the ministry, but he was. He had a very big following. And he would tell people the favorite subject he loved to teach on was the Song of Solomon, and he wanted to teach on sexual intimacy and marriage. And he was very raw and raunchy about it. But it was like, hey, the Bible talks about this. We don't need to be afraid of it, da da da. Yeah, it does. But, you know, Adam knew his wife doesn't really, you know, it's not raw and raunchy. He knew his wife in a very intimate way. Okay? And she conceived, so everyone knows they weren't shaking hands, okay? And, and bore Cain, bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Now, there are some debate about that phrase, but some even believe it means, I have acquired a man, even the Lord. Like, but there does seem to be consensus that she thought, because of the promise that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, that the first child she had would be that Messiah. What a disappointment. The way Cain turned out. Verse 2, then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep. We call them what? Shepherds, very good. 
But Cain was a tiller of the ground. We call them farmers, right? And in the process of time, over a period of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Now, we don't know exactly what this is. You know, I always, just for fun, like to call it rutabaga or zucchini. And he brought this zucchini. I mean, it's really nice zucchini. Really big and nice and tasty. I mean, it was, it, it won the blue ribbon at the state fair, you know. I mean, it was, it was really good. There's one problem with it. You don't bring zucchini. See, Abel, or Cain, is trying to do it his way, right? By the way, in the New Testament, both in 2 Peter and I believe in Jude as well, it talks about the way of Cain. The way of Cain, talking about religious false teachers who try to approach God apart from a blood sacrifice. They don't teach a message of redemption through blood. They don't really preach the gospel. They preach a message of human achievement instead of divine accomplishment. The fruit of their own hands. Verse 4, Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock. Now that's pretty good, huh? Firstborn of your flock? First one to come out, as it were? Boom, he's on it. He didn't say, oh, by the way, the first one, that's really nice looking. I'm not offering that to God. I'm keeping that one for me. No. And of their fat. Verse 4, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering. Respected Abel and his offering means that he acknowledged that Abel came the right way with the right offering. This is good. I respect this. I accept this. It's what I have communicated. Verse 5, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. You know, Cain had a high view of himself. Cain had a high view of his offering. Cain thought, I like my offering. Certainly God will like my offering, right? Wrong. You're not coming God's way. And you know, there's a lot of people today who are trying to come to God and go to heaven their way. And when you tell them the gospel, they get angry and their countenance falls. Because they've been banking on their works. You're telling me that, you know, all those things I've ever done aren't going to get me to heaven? Right. Hmm. I don't like that. And I don't like you. You must be in a cult, you know, kind of thing. That's exactly. He's angry. In fact, he's not angry. He's very angry. He is seething with anger, and his countenance fell. In other words, he showed it all over. There was no doubt about where he stood. And there are some people like that. There are some people that have poker faces. You can't tell what they're thinking. And then you can tell others. You just walk in the room and look at them and you know. Right where they're at. That's Cain. Verse 6. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Now, isn't that kind of interesting? You know, one of the ways you deal with an angry person is you ask them questions. To try to get them to talk. To try to express why they're angry. And hopefully to show them that their thinking isn't right. That's what God did here. Why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? Question, did he not know? What were the previous questions God asked? Do you remember? To Adam and Eve in the garden, right? Why? Because he didn't know. But he wanted them to confess, to admit it. Verse five, 7, if you do well, will you not be accepted? Now, doing well would mean what in this context? What's doing well? Offer the right sacrifice. Come by faith. Come the way I told you. That's doing well in this context. Will you not be accepted? There's still opportunity. And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you. But you shall rule over it. Verse 8. Now Cain talked with Abel his brother. Now, what do you think he said? We don't know, do we? Think he was pretty happy with Abel? Think he was pretty ticked? Probably gave him a piece of his mind he couldn't afford to lose. 
And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother. And what did he do? He killed him. Killed him. You see, God's word, though limited in its revelation and man's conscience, would now have to be the standard of good and evil. He has a conscience. And he has some revelation, but he doesn't have much. But then again, unto whom little is given, you're still required to respond. And so we see the difference in offerings. One's accepted, one is not. And then Cain, in his anger, actually does the first murder. In fact, it is possible that the very knife that Abel used to kill his animal sacrifices could have been used by Cain to kill him. We don't know. We know that he murdered him. He killed him, verse 8. Let's continue, though. Verse 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? Now, is he asking because he doesn't know? He's asking because he wants to get him to admit. He said, I do not know, you liar. Am I my brother's keeper? Well, there's a sense that you are. And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Spill the blood on the ground. The voice of the blood is crying out to the all-knowing God. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. Now, in other words, if you thought the curse was bad before, wait until you see it now. In addition, a fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. You're going to just wander from place to place. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond of the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. In other words, it's all your fault, God. God, you are a ruthless dictator. You're unable to be pleased. Oh, no, 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 no. But isn't it interesting? How oftentimes people blame God for things they're guilty of or the consequences they're experiencing. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. In other words, people were, did not have the right at this point, like under human government, to take another man's life who shed someone's blood. That will come after the flood. There was no capital punishment at this time. Yea, there was no human government at this time. And one of the reasons why human government will come into place is because conscience does not restrain man sufficiently, nor, apart from human government, is are sufficient consequences dished out. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife. She conceived and bore Enoch. Now that's not the same Enoch, different Enoch that we read about later. Or we read about, no, later, yes. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad begot Bahul Jael, and Bahul Jael begot Methusheel, and Methusheel begot Lamech. Then Lamech took for himself two wives. So now we have the first case of polygamy in the Bible. The name of the one was Adah, and the name of the second was Zillah, and Adah bore Jabel. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. So now we're not talking about a farmer alone, we're talking about a farmer with livestock. 
His brother's name was Jubal, and he was the father of all those who play the harp and flute. Musicians. See, the line of Cain, the ungodly line, is still very creative because they have the image of God. But they're in absolute rebellion. And so, verse 22, and as for Zillah, she also bore Tubal, Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. So again, very creative. And the sister of Tubal, Cain, was Naamah. Then Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. Wives of Lamech, listen to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. And if Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy sevenfold. Wow, he's just rebellious, isn't he? But then again, rebel dads don't usually um, raise real good compliant sons, do they? Wow. Now, did you know there were those in the past and probably still in white supremacist group today, that taught that the mark of Cain was that he turned him, God made him black. And that the line of Cain is the line of the black race, Afro-American as we would call it today. And that they're a cursed race, and this is one of the ways they justified slavery actually twisting the Bible out of its context, misinterpreting this to justify slavery. If people think that what you believe doesn't affect how you behave, think again. They use this mark of Cain to try to prove that. Because there is a connection with Noah and his sons and his sons' wives who had a connection here back with Cain. And so, man's state at the beginning was guilty. Man's responsibility is obey God on the basis of conscience plus some limited revelation. Man's failure was he did that which is only evil continually. Continually. Chapter 6 of Genesis. And let's begin in verse 1. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. Notice when men, unqualified, began to multiply on the face of the earth. And the daughters, and daughters were born to them. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful. And they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever. For he is indeed flesh, yet his day shall be 120 years. Therefore, there were giants in the, on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, and the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So we see here that... The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Total failure by way of conscience and man violating conscience in the process. What factored into this? Well, what factors into this is number one, again, Adam's image or likeness was now upon mankind by way of a sin nature. Secondly, what factored into this was this diabolical plan of Satan involving the sons of God who came into the daughters of men and bore children to them. Now, 
Now, when it comes to this phrase, sons of God, there are two primary interpretations regarding this. Now, I want you to go to 2 Peter chapter 2. Now, how many of you heard my message when I explained this a couple months ago? Okay, okay, you did. Okay, some of you did, good. Maybe you'll remember this time. Next time. And those who aren't part of DBC didn't hear it probably. But 2 Peter chapter 2. We're working our way through chapter, or 2 Peter. Verse 4, for if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, Tartarus, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then, if, 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 then, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly, like Noah, like Lot, out of temptations and to reserve the unjust, like the angels, like the ancient world, like Sodom and Gomorrah, under punishment for the day of judgment. Now, there's two primary views when it comes to these sons of God. Number one is that they're angels, and number two, they are the faithful sons, as it were, of Seth. Those are the basic two views. Now, some have kind of a third view, a hybrid view, that they are just kind of like renown, renown, people of power that may have some demonic involvement. Kind of a hybrid view. Now, I am convinced that the phrase sons of God refers to angel. Why is that? First of all, because the phrase sons of God in the Old Testament never refers to men, but only to angels. Only to angels. That's reason number one. So I, I believe that the angels that sinned but were cast down to Tartarus cannot be all of the bad angels. It can't be referring to the initial rebellion because not all the angels are in Tartarus. So it has to involve those original demons, a select group of them, a subset of them, that were involved in this. Now as you think of the phrase sons of God, look at how it's used here. Okay. First of all, Job chapter 1, verse 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Sons of God here are angels just like Satan. Chapter 2, verse 1, Again, there was a day when the sons of God, Benahi Elohim, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Job 38, verse 7, When the morning stands, sang to together at creation, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. All the sons of God shouted for joy. And so that phrase is only used in the Old Testament in reference to angels. Now in the New Testament, the Son of God can refer to Jesus Christ, or sons of God can refer to believers. Sons of God, as it was used in the Old Testament, are not called sons of God in the New. They are called angels or spirits, depending on the context, as we will see. There are also some other phrases that are used, like Manai Elohim, again, sons of the Almighty, or angels. Bar Elohim, a son of God or an angel. The word sons, directly created by God, is the idea. And so the phrase sons of God in the Old Testament never refers to men, but only to angels. That's the first reason why I think in Genesis 6 there's angels. 
Number two is because of the language of Genesis 6. The language of Genesis 6, verses 1 through 4. Verse 1 again. Now it came to pass... My notes here. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. Is men qualified? Unqualified. And I say that because if you're going to argue for the line of Cain versus the line of Seth, you would think there would be some qualification here, but they're not. That men began to multiply on the face of the earth, just like God commanded. And when daughters, which now are female, were born to them, unqualified again, that the sons of God, which again is used in reference to angels, fallen angels in this context, saw the daughters of men. Not just Cain's line, but Cain and Seth's line. All humanity. And they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Took wives. By the way, it's used in various places in the Old Testament to mean to take in marriage. There's an intermarriage here between the angels and human daughters. Interesting, if it was just humans marrying, why no sons of men marrying daughters of God? The phrase isn't found. Verse 3, and the Lord God said, the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive or restrain or remain with man, humanity forever. No distinction between the line of Seth or Cain. For he is indeed flesh, yet his day shall be 120 years until the judgment comes the flood. There were giants in the land in those days, Nephilim, fallen ones. And also for afterward, when the sons of God came in, by way of sexual intercourse, to the daughters of men, and they, the women, bore children to them, the angels. Those were the mighty men, mighty in their rebellion, mighty in their strength, who were of old men of renown. Now question, if this was just involved a demon-possessed man having sex with a woman. Why would the offspring be mighty? Because could that happen today? Could you have a demon-possessed man having sex with a woman today? Sure. Would the product be a giant? A mighty man? No. This had to be something more. Had to be something more. So the language of this passage supports the intermarriage of sinful cohabitation of fallen angels with human daughters, resulting in the Nephilim or giants or mighty men who are part of the reason for the judgment of God to come by way of the universal flood. Now, in doing so, did you know, and I pointed this out when we were in 2 Peter, that both 2 Peter and Jude refer to the book of Enoch. Now, Enoch is an extra-biblical book. But bo that book is quoted or referenced at least twice. 2 Peter and Jude, and Jude and 2 Peter. Uh, clearly, Jude read 2 Peter. Did you know in the book of Enoch, there's a major section on this whole issue? And in that section, you know who the sons of God are? Angels. Angels. Not the godly line of Seth. And that's the third reason why the sons of God refer to angels, because of the New Testament commentary in Jude, verses 6 and 7, and 1 Peter 3, 18 and 20, let alone 2 Peter 2, verse 4. Again, here's what Jude says. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but who left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Pause. In the initial rebellion, when one-third of the angels followed Satan... Did that, is that what happened to them? Are they in everlasting chains today? They're not. This has to refer to a select group among that group that were taken out of commission due to something. 
But notice the next event that follows here in reference to Jude. What was the sin they committed? As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual morality and gone after strange flesh. The word strange means foreign, that which is not natural to them. These cities are set forth as an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And so it's foreign flesh, as it were. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 3, we see a similar thing said. For Christ also suffered for us, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. In the Greek, this word by could be translated in. The word the is not there, and it could just be saying, being made alive in spirit. Because remember, on the cross, Jesus Christ spiritually died. He was separated from God, right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So when did he get spiritually restored, if he had spiritually died? Well, still on the cross. So he ends it by, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Remember, it was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He's in fellowship. My God, my God, he's suffering spiritual separation and abandonment. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He's back. It's been restored. And in that spiritual state, by the way, by whom means in that state, he, Jesus Christ, went and he preached to the spirits in prison. And the word spirits without a qualifier in the New Testament refers to demonic or angelic spirits who were in prison. What prison? Well, Second Peter tells us in Tartarus. Really, when did that happen? Who formerly were disobedient. Really, when were they disobedient? When once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah? While the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is, eight souls were saved through fire. Slam dunk, as far as I'm concerned. Clearly, this is Genesis 6. And they're not humans, they're spirits. And that is why, also in the chronological order, in 2 Peter 2, verses 5 and 6, we read, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to Tartarus and deliver them into chains of darkness to reserve for judgment. And notice he calls them angels here. Then, next, Genesis 7, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. And then Genesis 19, he brings in Sodom and Gomorrah. He uses three examples of God's intervention in human history by way of judgment, and in doing so, he does so in chronological order. Again, marshalling an argument for the fact that these angels are the sons of God in Genesis 6. By the way, how did Bible students of more ancient times understand Romans 6? The ancient rabbis, the Septuagint translators, which was the Greek translation of the Old Testament that was written 200 years or so before Christ came. And the early church fathers all believed the sons of God were angels. The view that they were the line of Seth would come along later. What are some of the problems with the sons of God referring to the unfaithful sons of Seth marrying the ungodly daughters of Cain's view? First of all, the text itself does not say sons of Seth and daughters of Cain. How can the phrase daughters of men be restricted to just the daughters of Cain in light of Genesis 6, 1 and 2? There's no qualifier. I pointed this out early. There's no indication that the lines of Cain and Seth were kept separate from each other and that the line of Seth was even godly in light of those who died in the coming flood because everybody died but eight people, so obviously the line wasn't too godly. But here is the issue, and this is what you know, a little bit confused me for years to know how to answer this. What are the objections to angelic beings marrying and cohabiting with women? What are the objections? Objection number one, angels are spiritual beings by nature without physical bodies and sexless. Therefore, how could this occur? That was the first issue, right? Question, are angels sexless? I would contend that they're clearly male. If there is any females, 
We don't know that because we do know the angels in the Bible. What were their names? Tell me, tell me three angels' names in the Bible. In fact, you can give me four, but tell me three. Michael, Gabriel, Lucifer. You know the fourth one? Legion. Legion, but that was a whole bunch of them, right? The three names we have, they're all male. Interesting enough, all the pictures we have usually in books are female. Well, yes, the Genesis account, and that's where I'm going to go next. Yeah. While spirits do not have flesh and bones, Luke 24, 39, angels can possess or materialize a human body, Genesis 18 and 19, with normal human functions. Furthermore, angels in the Bible are always described in the male gender. Now, without going there, you remember the story of Genesis 18, three people come to visit Abraham, right? Two are angels and one is the Son of God, Jesus Christ, in pre-incarnate form. What did they look like? They look like angels? They all look like men. They all have the body of a man. Question, could they do normal bodily functions? Did they sit down and have a meal? Yeah, they did. Did they use their hand and pull Lot in when the homosexuals are pressing against the door? Yeah. Now, if they could eat food, do you think they could go to the toilet? I'd be prone to think they could. I'd be prone to think they could do everything. But were they human beings who were indwelt by angels? Is that what the Bible says? Or were they angels that materialized in a human body? And if that is if they are able to do that, and they are, then why couldn't they, as angels, have physical sexual relations with women? I believe there's every reason to think they could. In fact, it's that very reason why they got put out of commission. Because God had put a parameter, a boundary there that says, listen, your angels, those are men and women. You do not cross that boundary. Period. And some said, we're doing it anyhow. And God said, I'm taking you out of commission because of it. And I'm going to put you in Tartarus as a result. Now here's the other question. Angels do not marry. That's what everyone says, right? Why do they say that? Because Mark 12, 25 says that angels in heaven do not marry. But that doesn't mean that angels on earth cannot, just like man. Henry Morris writes, and I quote, When Jesus said that the angels of God in heaven do not marry, this does not necessarily mean that those who have been cast out of heaven were incapable of doing so. It clearly was not God's will or intention that angels mix in such a way with human women, but these wicked angels were not concerned with obedience to God's will. In fact, it was probably precisely for the purpose of attempting to thwart God's will that this particular battalion of the sons of God engaged in this illegal invasion of the bodies of the daughters of men. And so I think there's every reason to think that these are angels. I think the evidence personally is overwhelming. Now, if someone says, well, I disagree with that interpretation, I take the view that they, the sons of God are the godly line of Seth, I would say, well, praise the Lord. You know, you're, you have a right to that interpretation. That's not a doctrinally wrong. I just don't think it's contextually right. And it's one of the few footnotes that I disagree with in the Schofield Bible because he took this line of stuff, at least the original Schofield. I think the revised Schofield stated both views. Mark 12, 25, for when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Now here's an interesting verse to consider. Matthew 8, 28 and 29. When Jesus had come to the other side, to the country of the Gersonines, 
They met him, two demon-possessed men coming out of, the tomb, out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now question, why would they even raise the question that he came to torment them before the time? Did they know there was a time of judgment coming? Why would they even raise the question, did you come to torment us before the time, unless perhaps there had been a time earlier in which certain angels were punished and tormented by virtue of a diabolical plot in order to thwart the bloodline of the Messiah in light of the promise of Genesis 3.15. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing in these passages. Now, let me just pause and open it up for questions before we go on. We're obviously only going to finish this lesson tonight. You can stretch, you can... You can kiss Casey, we won't look. You know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, any questions about this? Yeah, you can go right online and get it. Yeah, there's several versions of it, I'm told. I had somebody email me after and said, well, you know, what version of the Book of Enoch are you referring to? And I said, well, I actually didn't read it. I just read sections of it that were taken and used. So I didn't take the time to read it myself just the sections that were used. But I'll tell you, there's certainly things that aren't, you know, accurate in it. But I, but I will also tell you that there's no doubt there were angels in the Book of Enoch. They were not, the, you know, the line of Cain versus the line of Seth. Again, that was the historic view for centuries. That was the view. The New Testament, I think, does a slam dunk on it. Like I said, but I know of some that you know hold otherwise, and you know I just think they're wrong. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It's not really a doctrinal issue, does it? Hey, Gus. Yeah. It'll be forever recorded. Um, just a couple of uh, questions. One, if, if angels had the capacity for marriage, if that was a function of angels or something they were capable of, and also for reproduction, why is this sort of hotly debated passage, meaning there's, there's pretty strongly held opinions on both sides of this, why is this sort of cryptic reference the only place that you really find discussion of angels either marrying or producing offspring? And thirdly, um, if you could speak a little bit more to the idea of this is all leading up as an explanation for a worldwide flood. Yes. And does the evil of angels seem like the better explanation for what brought about the destruction of all mankind or man's own evil as the focus of, of the need for a worldwide flood? Yeah, well, good questions. Now, let me, uh, I'll answer the last one since I remember that the best. Um, I think both factored in. I think the demonic cohabiting with the daughters of men, with the offspring it produced, helped necessitate the flood. But so did, obviously, the fact that the majority of the world were not the offspring of that cohabitation. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that was corrupt everywhere. And violence filled it. So I think it, it's both a violation of conscience, a corruption of man, as well as the satanic element. So I think all of them mixed together is what helped cause the flood. Um, as far as why is it isn't taught in other passages? Well, first of all, it is taught at least three times in the New Testament. Number two, it's not taught or referred to in other passages because it was never attempted again. This was the only time it was ever attempted. And the angels know very well the consequences of it. And Satan says, we're not doing that one again because <laughs> obviously God stopped it. So I think that would be my answer to that. It just never happened again. So there was no need to refer to it 
as far as a second diabolical attempt. But it is referred to, like I said, three times in the New Testament. Two times by Peter and once by Jude. Yes. Yep. Reference to this incident. No other incidents because it wasn't attempted again. Okay? Let's look at man's failure under conscience a little more. We just have about 20 minutes left. Sports fans, hang in there, okay? Number two, the earth was corrupt and filled with violence, we're told. Genesis 6, 11 and 12. And the earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Three times. Corrupt, corrupt, corrupted. By the way, isn't it interesting that the very thing God will put into action in the next dispensation to stop this is what? Human government and the tendency of human government is to still be corrupt because humans function in it. And yet, that's even better than not. God says human government that's even corrupt is better than no government at all. Next is man's judgment. Again, every dispensation ends with judgment, and the judgment in this case was the universal flood set forth in Genesis 6, 7, and 8. The judgment that came upon the earth was the worldwide flood. Genesis 7, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month. By the way, does this sound figurative? Look at the details. It tells you the day. On the day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up. Now please note that. We tend to think that all this stuff, all this rain came from above. Oh no, most of it came from below. The great fountains, these major pockets of water that were in the subterranean oceans were exploding up into the air, creating a rain effect, but coming from below. And the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Someone has estimated that if it was to rain all around the world simultaneously right now, it would only last for 14 minutes. And that's one of the objections people say there couldn't have been a universal flood. There are some who believe in the vapor canopy theory. That's another discussion. But clearly, we see the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were open. So both effects were there. Genesis 7, 23, so he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the earth, both man and camel, creeping thing and the bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And why is that? Because God in his grace through the ark preserved Noah and his family. As an absolute act of grace. Now, do you remember when I taught on the ark here not long ago in 2 Peter? If you don't, that's fine. I'm going to move very quickly and just give you some really neat facts about the ark here. From Genesis 6 through 8. Some facts, and these are not the same as any Hollywood movie that you have seen. That always screw it up. Number one, the designer of the ark was God himself. Noah did not design the ark, God did. Noah simply followed God's design and directions. Fact number two, the size of the ark was 1,500, excuse me, 1,518,750 cubic feet, comparable to 1.5 football fields with a ratio of 30 times 5 times 3, making it virtually impossible to capsize. According to the shipbuilders, this ratio is the optimal design for stability in rough seas. And you must keep in mind that the ark was not a ship designed to cut through water from one location to another. It was basically a barge designed to float in a flood. But it was huge, with no ships constructed bigger until around 100 years ago. And by the way, these pictures come from the real-life replica of the ark at the Answers in Genesis Park in Kentucky, which I would love to see. 
Based on Genesis 6, the size of the ark was approximately 450 feet, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. The ark had three decks, one skylight, one door. The dark was made out of gopher wood, most likely cypress or cedar. Kind of interesting. Fact number three. Again, the ark had three stories or decks and could hold the equivalent of 569 standard railroad cars and was 120 years in the making. Now this size would be needed for a number of things, including keeping the animals safe from the flood. And I read that if the average size animal was the size of a sheep, it means the ark could hold over 125,000 sheep. 100,000 square foot of floor space. Now keep in mind, when two by two came in, they did not have to be adults. They didn't have to be two adult elephants, two adult, right? They could be babies, male and female. And by the way, people have said, now how did they ever get two by two to get in there? How do you ever do that? Well, God did it. God drew them. I mean, can you imagine eight people trying to round all that up and get them in? In fact, they said they tried to duplicate this at a Hollywood movie, and they were just frustrated. They couldn't do it. Fact number four, the ark's size would easily allow for all of every kind of air-breathing animals. Authorities on taxonomy estimate that there are less than 18,000 species of mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians living in the world today. If we double this to allow for extinct species, we have 36,000 species, and if there were two of every kind, that would make 72,000 animals. Now keep in mind that God did tell Noah to take two of every variety. He didn't say take two of every variety of dog or cat or whatever, as there's many varieties within a kind that could later develop into various varieties within the boundaries of still being that animal. You know, within the genetic structure of a dog, through breeding, you can come up with all kinds of dogs, all kinds of different dogs. You don't need all the varieties to fit on the ark. You just need two of every kind. Frankly, there was more than enough room on the ark to have two of every kind of animal, as God said. Fact number five, the flood was a global flood requiring Noah and his family to stay in the ark for a whole year. If you read the biblical text closely along with other Old Testament passages, you'll discover that this universal flood was caused not only by the moisture in the atmosphere, but due to the volcanoes of the deep erupting and sending huge amounts of water into the air, creating a rain-like effect for 40 days and 40 nights so that the water filled the earth to the top of the mountains. Now, how do you have Water to the top of a mountain if, mountain, if water seeks its lowest level, if it's a local flood. And I say that because there are small, many, many seminaries today. I'm not talking about seculars. I'm talking about seminaries who teach there was no such thing as a universal flood, that it was a local flood. If it was, with that description, it would have been an incredible miracle looking like this. But it was a global, universal, catastrophic flood that took a year before Noah and his family were able to depart into dry land. And according to the Institute of Creation Research in Dallas, at least five effects of the flood were the continents, as the flood broke apart the supercontinent into today's continents. There's every reason to think it was all one land mass to begin with. In fact, Genesis 10 alludes to that. Furthermore, it created the mountains where the continents slammed together. They pushed up today's mountains. It helped create the fossil record. Most of the fossil record is a result of the flood. In fact, you think of fossil fuels involve usually vegetation that is submerged under tremendous pressure in a short period of time before it can rot that results later in a fossil fuel. Where did all that vegetation come from? What, where was the uh, pressure caused by? Well, the flood. Sedimentary layers, along with the fossil record, the flood formed most of the sediment, Earth's sedimentary layers. 
as well as the Ice Age. The flood caused a global ice age that lasted about 500 years. Number six, the causes of the flood involved the corruption of the human race and the widespread wickedness of mankind. And that corruption of the human race included the sons of God cohabiting with the daughters of men. It was a major cause of this, though not the only cause, because God then saw the wickedness of man, that it was great in the earth, just not just that byproduct of that cohabitation, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord is sorry that he had made man, and so forth. This is the description of unrestrained expressions of a depraved heart and rebellion against God and conscience that God implanted upon every human soul. Fact number seven is there's only one door on the ark, and apart from Noah and his family, the whole world perished. One door on the ark. There was only one way of escape from the flood of Noah's day, and that was the ark, a type of Christ according to 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21. And there was only one door of entrance into that one ark, not two, not three, not four, just one door. What a wonderful picture again of what Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. And there came a day which the waters came. And I've said before, and I, I, when I taught this, there's every reason to think that Noah and his sons actually hired out. I mean, that's a huge, huge boat to build, even in 120 years, for eight people. Hired out. Can you imagine someone who rejected the truth that Noah preached for that 120 years and failed to get in the ark, and they ended up in hell, and someone says to them, so what did you do on the earth? They said, well, I helped build the ark. You built the ark. Why didn't you get in? Well, I didn't believe. I didn't believe in the ark. I didn't believe in the judgment of God through a flood. He had never done it that way before. But once God shuts the door, no one else can enter it, and it's too late. So how did Noah get in? By faith being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. And how did he obtain that righteousness? The same way that Abraham will attain it, by faith in the Lord, apart from law, ritual, and works. Kind of reminds me of John 5, 24, most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death into life. And the symbol of the covenant and promise that God would never destroy the, world, the earth again is given by the sign of the rainbow. The rainbow according to Genesis chapter 9, verses 11, 15 through 16. Now, I heard somebody point this out. I just heard this recently, and I thought it was fascinating. I, I wouldn't be dogmatic on it, but I want you to think of a rainbow here. A bow, right? It's a bow. And instead of God taking, as it were, a bow and destroying the world through a flood. Instead, he takes his bow, and he puts it down, and he says, I won't do that again through water. And we know what he will do in the future is he'll do it through fire. And his, every time you see a rainbow, that is a reminder that God said he'd never destroy the world through a flood again. Now, question. If it was only a local flood and a universal flood, he lied. Because local floods happen all the time. But there's no universal flood. And his visual expression of his promise is that rainbow. And he won't do that again. I tell you, the Bible's neat. 
is really neat. Genesis 9 says, Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off. Notice all flesh, not local. Be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth, not local. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. Okay, questions? Okay, I'm going to grab a mic. I have two quick questions. The first one, I'll just say them both before I forget them. In Genesis 6, where it says uh, God was sorry, yes. I was wondering if you could comment on just what he's meaning by that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it means he was sorry. <laughs> well, like, no, what, what this means is this. Does God have emotions? Yes. Yeah, and the idea is one of regret. That he has a sense of regret. Now, remember at times when God's word communicates things about God, he does so in expressions that relate to man. Can we relate to someone being sorry for doing something? Yeah. Now, did God know this was going to happen? Sure. But does God still have a right to, in a sense, be sorry that this had happened? It just yeah. sounds weird to say that God regrets creating mankind. Well, no, he regret creating man. He regretted creating man in view of the fact that man corrupted themselves in the way they did. Like, for example, let me use this as an illustration. Let's say you and Casey have a child, okay? And that child tends to, to be a lawbreaker, hell raiser, a Jensen at the worst kind, okay? okay? Can you get to a point where you just say, I am just so sorry. You know, I, I, I love my child, but I'm just so sorry he's turned out the way he is. You know, if I have no greater joy than my children walk in truth, I have no greater pain when they don't. And I think God is just expressing in human terms of emotion that we can relate to. That he just says, I am just so sorry that man has done this. It's their fault. Satan has factored into this. They've got along with it. They have violated their conscience. And I'm going to have to destroy all men. And I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry that man is the way they are. I, I think that's what it is. Now, in the King James Version, it said God repented that he had made that. Yeah, but the word repent there isn't the Hebrew equivalent to metanoia changed his mind. It's really the Hebrew word for regret or sorrow. Okay, next question. Uh, next question. Uh, I'm not sure if it specifies anywhere in the Bible that uh, the water for the flood, this isn't like a totally non-issue point, but I was thinking like the canopy view or like the flood, the water coming up. Did the water have to necessarily already be created or could it just, the water could have because a lot of the views seem to say like the water was already created, it was just it was either in the atmosphere, or it was underneath the earth. Yeah. Could God have just made more water? God can do anything. That's what I was just like. Yeah, I don't on know the why. other Some... hand, God usually uses means to accomplish ends. Yeah. Um, and I would say this: there's every reason to think that prior to the flood, it had never rained. Yeah. I remember it's that. Very clear in Genesis that a mist would come up from the earth and water the earth creating a greenhouse effect. And that's why, even to this day, I remember uh, hearing that, um, that uh, one of the Turman boys up in Alaska was actually digging out, was involved in an operation in which they were found, uh, I think, mammoths in ice. Yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. And I've, this has been documented many times. And not only, not Ben, his brother. Jake. Jake, yeah. And, and that this has been documented many times. They have found mammoth elephants up in Alaska, frozen in ice, with vegetation in their mouth or in their stomach, which means it hadn't even been fully digested yet. 
So for that to happen, to be in ice like that, means things had to happen this quick, which means most Bible teachers teach that when the flood happened and everything started, that the polar ice caps formed at some point very quickly to create that ice effect prior to that. There was no polar caps, per se. Everything was tempered all over the world. <laughs> Duluth would even have been attractive. Hey. OK, good questions, though. Another question any of you have. Um, a question from my brother. He's asking about what about the giants after the flood if uh, the sons of men and daughter, or sons of God and daughters of men were the source of giants before the flood? Yes. Um, and I assume he's asking about their nature there and origin. There were giants origin. on the earth in those days. And also afterward, OK, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, see, and also afterward, looks like there were giants in the land afterward. I don't think so. I think, and also afterward, when the sons of God, uh, and also afterward is talking about what's following then, not what's going back. Secondly, it is true that there is the phrase Nephilim that's used later in Genesis. Do you remember that? Or in Numbers? It goes in Numbers. Um, I think Brett Nazareth was right. I think, when, I think he taught it here. That Nephilim eventually became a buzzword for just this giant, notorious person. And that it wasn't actually one biologically connected with the pre-flood people. Otherwise, he'd have to be on the ark, right? Or in the genetic structure of one of those people on the ark. It seems to be better to understand that there was um, that became a buzzword, like we would say. Um, let's see if I can think of one. Uh, you know, he is a he is a a what? A beast, or he is a, a Benedict Arnold, or he is a you know terms we use. That doesn't mean he's really Benedict Arnold, but he's Benedict Arnold-like kind of thing. Now it is true. In Canaan land, for example, when the spies went in, there were giants in the land. There were some big heathen people. But then again, where did the uh, races come from? Where did the sizes come from? Why even to this day? Are there shorter people, larger people, taller people, bigger people? Well, that's the human race genetic structure is capable of all of that. And one of the things I may assign to you, I, I, I was debating this today is to listen to a message by Dr. John Whitcomb that he taught here years ago. And he's very famous for this series in Genesis. It's his bread and butter, in which he explains about how the races develop and all of this, a very fascinating message. And I don't know if I'll assign it to you or not, and if so, if it'll be this time or next. But I'm thinking about it. Yeah, I can send it to you either way. And if you have time, you can watch it. Fascinating. Fascinating explanation of, of, and he goes into the Tower of Babel, and he goes into all of this. Really, really neat. Because that's one of the questions everyone has, right? Where did the races come from? So forth, so forth. And it's, it's clearly the byproduct. In fact, we'll point out next time that when they got off the ark, you have Noah, and you've got Ham, Shem, and Japheth, right? Where did Ham go? Went south into Africa. Clearly. The black race are descendants of Ham. Where did Japheth go? He went up into Europe. Where did Shem go? Middle East and Asia. There's no question. Those are the direct, you can see it from Genesis 10 where they went. And from that, you get at least some idea who were the forefounders, as it were, of the European different people groups and so forth and so forth. Okay, but that's for next time, sports fans. So wow, we're done with another Gibbs class. Any questions before we pray and say amen? I will send.